to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey guys, what's going on? Hello. Hey, not much, man. Good to be on. Yeah, great to have you guys. And listeners, like always, it is great to have you. In our last couple of episodes, we were super blessed to have David Mitchell with us. And uh, David discussed the eschatological program in the book of the Psalms. And we spent some time asking him just a bunch of random questions. We hope that that was really encouraging to you listeners as you heard David work through uh, the eschatological program and and the way that the Psalms were organized. Uh, And so continuing through our discussion here of the Ketuvim, the writings, we want to continue with what's called the five scrolls, or in Hebrew, the Chamesh Megilot, which is the Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And guys, typically when we think about first century Jewish apocalyptic eschatology, we don't often think about these five books, right? So the question would be, why are they part of the Tanakh? How were they read and understood by the Jewish people before and during and after the time of Jesus? And that's really what we want to spend some time discussing today uh, these these five specific scrolls uh, that, again, aren't often thought about and aren't, aren't often discussed uh, and really aren't often part of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. So how were they read and understood? Well, before we get into this, just as a general introduction, I think it's easy to say maybe some of the same themes that we've seen throughout the Nevi'im We're going to continue to see in the Ketuvim and in the Jewish discussion around the Ketuvim, right? So themes of covenant and exile and redemption, um, the Lord doing what he promised, the covenantal curses, the blessings, eschatology, the Messiah. Of course, these are all the themes that are fresh on the minds of Jews as they're reading their scriptures. So let's get into this, guys. Let's talk about the five scrolls. Yeah, the five scrolls are a strange uh, phenomenon in Jewish tradition just because they are they're grouped together as five from the Talmudic period. And they're really a disparate collection of uh, uh, scrolls, books that are gathered together that uh, they don't really have any connection chronologically, historically, they're of different genre. They're of different, you know, um, in the Septuagint and later Christian tradition. Of course, they're in in different parts of the Bible, so uh, they're, they're uh, pulling together from historical narrative, from Ruth, from poetic, from Song of Solomon, uh, prophetic and Lamentations, wisdom and Ecclesiastes, and again, uh, you know post-exilic Esther kind of historical. And so the the question is, what ties them together? Uh, one is Jewish tradition. They're being read publicly at various feasts and holidays, Sabbaths, etc. Right. Um, the, the other is uh, just thematic as far as uh, tradition. And like you talked about, Josh, the those themes are most exemplified in the targums of these books. Mm. And so the targums of these five scrolls are all fairly late targums around the time of the Talmudic period. And so it's really helpful to read the targums of the five scrolls to really kind of draw out why they're gathered together in one, the five together, or why they're grouped together at any rate. And uh, and I think that kind of gives a, a little bit uh, of a, a context for why they're grouped the way they are. Good. In yeah. the Hebrew Bible, of course. Right. So as an introduction, I think it's a good idea to touch on, we've done it briefly because we mentioned, we mentioned the Targums every once in a while. Um A little bit of an introduction on the Targums, probably a little more elaborate than what we've done in the past, Um, because we also don't want to leave the wrong impression about the Targums and the role they play and and, uh, and these things. So uh, first, they are 
one, it's important to understand the Targums because the Targums um, are a translation of Hebrew text into Aramaic. And, um, and nobody, nobody questions that even though um, the, the texts are relatively late. Now, there's some, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a separate group of texts. They're not all written at the same time. But a lot of the texts are late. But everybody also acknowledges that the tradition of the Targums, uh, the translation of the Targums, that that tradition started much earlier than they were written down. And uh, Martin McNamara has been uh, the most, you know, the most respected voice. He's done more work in the Targums uh, in the last century than anybody else. And... um, He's he's done a lot of work on this, and I, I I would if you want to go any deeper in it, I would recommend a resource called uh, Targum and Testament. He did a remake of it called the Targum and Testament Revisited by Martin McNamara, and he gets a little technical at times, but it's a very helpful resource if you want to, you know, have a little bit better grid for what the Targums are. So, <clears throat> one you can't understand the Targums outside of the Israelite scribal tradition. So there's a scribal tradition in Israel where sacred texts were, were, were passed down through scribes. <clears throat> and, and part of that, part of that task, that sacred task, sometimes included the use of explanatory, explanatory phrases. And those were not seen as adding to the text or changing it. Those were simply seen as appropriating the text for a modern audience. Right. And so they were like, there's a lot of them in the Hebrew Bible that, that we've been handed down that you may not be aware of. Um, or, or you may have read over them and it maybe it stood out as odd, but they're scribal glosses in the Hebrew Bible. Like uh, here are a few ones that are, that these are common and they're frequent, though sometimes we skip over them not thinking what's being said. So like in uh, Joshua 18, verse 13, you have, from there the boundary passes along southward in the direction of Luz to the slope of Luz. And then there's a little phrase that says, that is Bethel. Well, the the term changed names later on after the text of Joshua was written. And so the scribe is simply adding an explanatory gloss explaining that it was now called Bethel. And you also have the same thing in 2 Chronicles 20. Messengers came, this is in verse 2, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 2. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. Already they are at Hazazon Tamar. And then the explanatory gloss says that is in Gedi because that was the name that that region was known by at the time another phrase that appears constantly throughout the Torah specifically is uh, like in Genesis 22 so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide as it is or as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided so what it's referencing is that after the time of Abraham, there was a long tradition of this phrase, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And he's simply connecting that phrase with the event in Genesis 22. And so there are a number of these phrases that they're, they're, they're scribal glosses in the Hebrew Bible that we become accustomed to. So the Targums are full of scribal glosses. And sometimes they're very elaborate, and sometimes they're very small, like this. Um, what The ones we'll be focusing on today will be some of the ones that are a little more elaborate. Because what we found is that the way a lot of the reading of these five books have been, the, the readings have been preserved in Jewish tradition, which is reflected a lot in the Targums, and we can see a lot of the influence that they could have potentially had on um, on Jewish culture around the first century. And so, like I said, a lot of them are late after the first century, but the oldest Targum manuscripts that were found were actually found at Qumran. And the Targum of Job and Leviticus were both found there, and they're suspected to have been written down between 100 
and 150, or I should say 150 and 100 BCE. So that said, Job, you could maybe ex- you could maybe understand that as a one-off. Maybe somebody just wrote down the tradition. It's hard to imagine Leviticus being written down without the rest of the Torah. And so it's likely that a lot of the, that, that or I don't, wouldn't say a lot, that several of the Targums were written down prior to the first century, but we have no idea of knowing how many. And um, a lot of the ones that we're left with right now um, have, have the text that we have is late, although the traditions arguably go, go back quite early. So that's, um, that's generally how it's best way to understand the Targums. We don't want anybody going out there saying, yeah, the Targums were all written, you know, around the time of the Maccabees. And so that's not true, but uh, some of them were, but it's, uh, we don't know a whole lot more beyond that. Yeah, that book that McNamara did is, I, I think it's his um, Targum and Testament, I think is his uh, revised doctoral thesis. Right, the original and, was the old one. Yeah, and it really, it really opened up a lot of, um, you know, the field of study on Targums and, and McNamara's kind of uh, modern father of, of Targum studies and... Uh, and it really showed that the you know the New Testament is uh, tied to the Targums. A lot of even Paul quoting, he's quoting the Targums rather than uh, just the Septuagint, uh, but really emphasizing the the uh, uh, centrality of the Targums to Jewish tradition at the time of the New Testament. It's a great book. Yeah. 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 Well, with that said, guys, let's dive in. Let's get into the five scrolls and let's dig into some of the Targums and see how the Jews have been thinking about some of these books uh, throughout their history. So let's start with the Song of Solomon. Yeah, Song of Solomon, the Holy of Holies. Um, So that's a joke. But uh, in... uh, So... Song of Solomon is a little bit like Job, like we mentioned last week. Like, you got to ask yourself, why is that even there? (laughs) Why on earth is that even in the Tanakh? But one of the things we want to highlight is that the literal interpretation, the idea that it's like some sort of uh, celebration of a love story or romantic love is like very, very new. That's not that's not the way either Jewish or Christian tradi- tradition interpreted it. Although we are definitely going to side heavily with Jewish tradition, because Christian tradition relies on what Christian tradition often does, which is supersessionism. Right. So, like when you're thinking about where, why the Song of Solomon or Canticles might appear in the Tanakh. Here's a citation by Rabbi Akiva um, from, uh, from the Talmud. It is in Sanhedrin 12, and he says uh, there's, a, there's a conversation back and forth about the value of the Song of Solomon. And Akiva says the whole world is not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the scriptures are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Then he continues on a bit later. He who trills his voice in chanting the Song of Songs in the banquet house and treats it as as a sort of song has no part in the world to come. In other words, whoever just treats it as a just a common song about a common theme, they have no part in the world to come. That's obviously very strong language. But the point is, is they obviously saw it as something beyond a celebration of a um, romantic love, and B, we'll find out that a lot of Jewish or a lot of Christian tradition really was completely anchored in supersessionism and the rejection of God choosing one people for God choosing the church. So um, <clears throat> the the tradition remains down to this day. Um, I, I believe Ashkenazi and Sephardic tradition still read it at least annually in the Pesach celebration for the liturgy. But the Mizrahi tradition, the the Arab and and the the 
Egyptian Jewish tradition reads it every week in on Shabbat, reads the Song of Solomon, which gives it obviously a lot of importance to Jewish tradition. Yeah, Bill, absolutely. And I think it it's so important to see this. Again, we want to look at this with weight towards Jewish tradition, of course, uh, because like you said, supersessionism is the way that later Christian tradition and even in, and specifically a lot of the modern interpretations often look at it. Uh, and so really, why would it be included in the Hebrew Bible if it wasn't about themes relating to God's covenant with Israel uh, and, exactly. and all of these ideas that we often see developed in the prophets already, because the author of the song uh, picks up on so much of the language from the prophets. And this is why some say that the song was probably written later, post-exilic, possibly after these ideas, because the prophets oftentimes, in, in passages we've talked about, uh, through our discussion of the Nevi'im in our past episodes in this season, the prophets pick up on this language between God and Israel in terms of uh, the marriage covenant, in terms of bride and bridegroom language. Uh, I think of a passage like Ezekiel 16. This is verse 7 and 8. It says, When I passed by you again and I saw you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. Um, other passages we could think of would be like Hosea 1 and Hosea 2, this marriage, this bridal imagery between God and Israel. Isaiah 62, as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over your bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And of course, the you is referring to the nation of Israel. So because the prophets are normalizing this language of this intimate language between God and Israel related to the covenant, I think Song of Solomon can be written without any interpretation because this is what's already understood and going on between God and Israel. Yeah, and it's strange that, you know, if you read like commentaries on the Song of Solomon and even its history of tradition, it's like the Jewish interpretation gets like a paragraph or two, and then you have like 20 different options for right. Christian, <laughs> right. you know, history of, of Christian tradition. It's like, no, the, the Jewish tradition really should yes. be number one, should be focused <laughs> on, and everything else should be held in, as suspect yes. in relation to that, you know? Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's get into the Targum of Canticles of the Song of Solomon, and uh, let's see if the Targums have anything, well, we are going to see that the Targums have some really cool things to say about these themes. Again, God's covenant with Israel, exile, redemption, judgment, these, the, the common themes that we should understand from the Torah and from the Nevi'im. We're going to see those laid out in the Targum of Canticles. Yeah, again, um, you know, acknowledging that the current text that we have of the Targums, um, of, of Targum Canticles, or the Song of Songs, is late. Uh, we don't know exactly how late, but it's definitely after the time of the New Testament. But let's also acknowledge that the text that you have of the Song of Solomon in the Hebrew Bible the earliest that we have is like 8th century of the Common Era. So let's right. not act like it's the only one. So I'm not trying to say that it's that, it's, that, it's that old, but I want to say just the fact that it's the text that we have is late shouldn't automatically mean that the tradition is late. Right. So the, the, uh, the Masoretic text is a very late text. It's, uh, it's, 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 you know, 7, 8, in some cases, 9, 10 hundred years after the time of Jesus is yeah. the, the text we have, the earliest text we have of some of the Masoretic. So um, jumping in, uh, Targum Canticles is just, if you, if you have any familiarity with the book of Song of Solomon, um, it's just, it's, it's so refreshing to read Targum Canticles. And if you can find it, and I think you can grab hold of it on Safaria, safaria.org, will have the Targum Canticles. It, it, it has Targum Canticles in, in English. Isn't that right? Yeah, it does. Okay. And it, so basically, it's a, it's a love poem between the Lord and Israel. 
Yep. And all the way through, every every little bit of imagery of kissing and running together and perfume, all of these things are related to God's covenant with Israel. Right. And the dynamic of the covenant related to exile and discipline and restoration and exile and eternal life and resurrection. I, I just like to make a pitch for it. It's a it's a wonderful um, it, it's wonderful just to to see the actual text explained in this way. If you if you're familiar with it at all, because it can be very confusing. But um, the the targum begins uh, kind of like like Rav Akiva above says it's the you know it's the holy of holies of the of all the texts you know and and uh, it, what, what he says in um, in the Hebrew text of the chapter one is it like in an introduction he says that it's the ninth of ten songs of redemption that God ordained from creation. And we were joking earlier before we started recording that the Targums are all about the number three, the number seven, and the number 10. Everything is three, seven, and 10. Yeah. But so this is, so this song in the Targumic tradition is song number nine of 10. The first one was sung by Adam when he, when God forgave the sin at the garden, he sang, he sang the first song, that was the first redemptive song. And then, of course, it goes through, like, you know, the when they left Egypt and then when they entered the land of Israel and then when they walked across the dead the or the Red Sea. And, and then it goes all the way to the 10th song, which will be the song that's sung by the exiles as they return from the final exile. So it definitely places this song as part of the narrative of redemption of the people of Israel. Yeah. That's like from verse one, that's what you get right in your face. And then you you go you go all the way through it, and there's literally there's too much to be able to put here that is just um that is it it really is super edifying to contemplate the way it, it interprets the Song of Solomon. Um so the the conclusion, the last chapter of Song of Solomon gets a lot of airtime. Gets, you know, gets written on a lot of wedding cards and all sorts of stuff. And there's worship songs. But so let's look at just the ending here about how they see some of these more familiar texts from Song of Solomon. So I'll start in chapter 8, verse 4. So the Hebrew text says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, not to stir up nor awaken love until it please. Okay, the Targumus interprets it this way. The King Messiah will say, I adjure you, O my people of the house of Israel, not to be stirred up against the nations of the world in order to escape from exile, nor to rebel against the hosts of Gog and Magog. Wait yet a little till the nations that have come up to wage war against Jerusalem are destroyed. And after that, the Lord of the world will remember for your sake the love of the righteous, and it shall be the Lord's good pleasure to redeem you. So so all of these things are understood. In, in other words, you can look at these things from a lot of different perspectives, but all they're saying is, duh, we should look at it from the perspective of the covenant. And so this is how the whole book is interpreted. Yeah, yeah. and then ne- the next verse, verse 5, the Hebrew text says, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Who says to her, Under the apple tree I wakened you. There your mother was in travail with you. There she who bore you was in travail. And then the Targumus interprets that and says, Solomon the prophet said, When the dead revive, the mount of anointing will split apart, and all the dead of Israel will issue from beneath it. And even the righteous who have died in exile will come by way of tunnels below the ground and issue from beneath the mount of anointing. And the wicked who have died and and been buried in the land of Israel will be cast out as a man casts a stone from a sling. Then all the inhabitants of the earth will say, what is the merit of this people that comes up from the earth in myriads upon myriads as on the day when she came up from the wilderness to the land of Israel? And that delights in the love of her Lord as on the day when she appeared beneath Mount Sinai to receive the Torah." 
At that hour, Zion, which is the mother of Israel, will give birth to her sons, and Jerusalem will receive her exiles. So it takes it and just frames wow. it in context to the coming up of the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead and the resurrection of Israel at the end of the age. Yeah, yeah. Well, That's incredible. it's incredible. Another another one that I think might you know have made it on certain. Uh, certain wedding invitations or cards or songs or whatever is Song of Solomon 8, 6, right? And the Hebrew text says, set me as a seal or a signet upon your heart, as a signet or seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy is harsh as Sheol or the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the flame of the Lord. Then the Targumist interprets that and says, the children of Israel will say on that day to their Lord, we beseech you, set us like the engraving of a signet ring upon your heart and the engraving of a signet ring upon your arm so that we shall never be exiled again. For the love of your divinity is as strong as death and the jealousy which the nations bear us is harsh, as harsh as Gehenom or Gehenna. And the enmity which they harbor against us is like the blazing coals of Gehenna, which the Lord created on the second day of the creation of the world to burn therein idolaters, right? So again, it interprets this as covenantal commitment between God and Israel, and then the the flames of fire, it interprets it in a very negative way. It interprets it related to the fires of Gehenna. Uh, so again, linking themes of judgment, covenant, faithfulness, uh, and all of this together in the Targum of the Song of Solomon. Yeah, let's look at a couple more verses here. Uh, uh, verse 7. Again, the, the, the conclusion here is really wrapping up a lot of ideas that have already been discussed throughout the book. Yeah. So the, 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 the great battle, the last battle against Gog and Magog and the coming of the nations against them, the resurrection, the one coming up from the wilderness is the company of the people of Israel coming up from the wilderness, raised from the dead out of the grave and just Amazing. beautiful. So um, let's, let's look at verse 7 here. The Hebrew text, many waters cannot quench love nor rivers, nor rivers sweep it away if a man should give all the wealth of his house for love. A double portion of plunder will he assign to him. Um, so the Targumist says, The Lord of the world said to his people, the house of Israel, Even if all the nations which are likened to the waters of the sea, which are many, should be gathered together, they would not be able to quench my love for you. And if I, Now, note here that love... Is, is a context to covenant faithfulness, not like my right. my warm fuzzies that I feel for you. Right. And if all of the kings of the earth who are likened to the waters of a river that flow strongly should assemble, they would not be able to blot you out from the world. And if a man should give all the wealth of his house to acquire wisdom in exile then I will return to him double in the world to come. Then all the spoil that will be plundered from the camp of Gog will be his. And Gog is, of course, a prominent eschatological. Down to this day, Gog and Magog is a, is a in, the, in the Tanakh, it's probably the most influential eschatological kind of apocalyptic scenario on Jewish tradition. A lot of those have been kind of relegated to the past, but Gog and Magog is a scenario that, that is still envisioned to be in the future. Um, but And so, again, you have the same thing where he's framing things around the future and around um, the, the covenant and exile and, and the future return when, uh, when God rewards him double in the world to come and he gets a spoil from the plunder of the camp of Gog, which is obviously implying a, the uh, the 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 army of Gog from like Ezekiel 38, 39. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's picked up, you know, in verse eight, the next verse that in the Hebrew text says, we have a sister who is little and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she shall be spoken against? And in the Targums, it says at that time, the angels in heaven will say to one another, we have one nation on earth whose merits are few and who has no kings or rulers to go out and wage war against the camps of Gog. What shall we do for our sister on the day when the nations speak of going up against her at war? 
And so it takes it and frames Israel against the nations at the end of the age, and the angels in heaven are speaking about the little sister who is young and and vulnerable yeah. and etc. And so, so it's you know for kind of the 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 modern hearer who hears this hears this and goes, well, this is just a radical distortion of the text, but. Not really in light of the apocalyptic tradition that had already been well established within Jewish tradition that the ultimate testimony of the Lord in context to the day of God, the redemption of Israel, Deuteronomy 30 pushed to its ultimate end, the resurrection of the dead, etc., then the inclusion of this poetic song by Solomon must mean this ultimate context. And so it's not a radical distortion. It's just how should we read these books in their ultimate context? Yeah, really good. Really good, guys. I, there's so much more we could say about Canticles, the Song of Solomon. But we have five books that we have to cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we do have to move on. But let's move on to Ruth, guys. Let's talk a little bit about Ruth here. I think one of the things about the book of Ruth that I think is super fascinating that a lot of people, of course, have recognized is that God, the God of Israel, is hardly mentioned in the text. And, you know, there's the story of Boaz and Ruth and then Ruth giving birth and then the whole connection in chapter four of, of Ruth with the genealogy of King David. But you know, the the larger point of the, the story, Ruth, who's a Moabite, right? Ruth is not from any of the tribes of Israel. She's a Gentile, and she's used to bring restoration to Naomi's family through Boaz. And, you know, Boaz, of course, his name means generous or loyal. Um, and so all of these ideas are drawn in, again, if we go and look at the Targum of Ruth, these ideas of Israel's family history and where this is going, so lineage and uh, the Davidic Messiah, and God restoring Israel, God fulfilling his covenantal promises. These are the things that are picked up by the Targumists in the Targum of Ruth. So, for example, even in a real similar passage to what we've referenced before, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, in the Targum of Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, we get the story of 10 famines. And and I, for the sake of time, I won't read all of this, but basically it says 10 famines were decreed by heaven and the first famine was in the days of Adam and then the second was in the days of Lamech and the third was in the days of Abraham and the fourth was in the days of Isaac and on and on and on and on until the ninth and then the 10th comes along. And and this is all laid out just in the, the Targum of Ruth chapter one. And it in essence, is delineating Israel's history from creation until the coming of Messiah, a lot like we've talked about before in the cloud apocalypse from 2 Baruch. Like This is exactly what the cloud apocalypse does with the dark waters and the bright waters delineating Israel's history in that way. Um, and the 10th famine specifically here in the Targum of Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 says that the 10th famine is due to come, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but to hear the word of prophecy from the Lord. And there was this great famine in the land of Israel, and then this noble man goes forth, and then the story of Ruth continues. But this 10th famine uses that same language from one of the prophets, from the Nevi'im, specifically from Amos, Amos verse, uh, Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. And, and again, how the Targumists would continue to draw on the language of the prophets to outline as you're saying, John, everything being pushed to its ultimate end and God continuing his covenantal faithfulness to the people of Israel uh, and how this was all going to play out in their history. So the Targum of Ruth, in talking about the story of Boaz and Ruth and all of this that, that's mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, develops all of this in the same way. Yeah, I think a great example of this is in chapter 2 where Boaz declares a blessing uh, over Ruth, and he says in verse 12, The Lord repay you for what you've done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Speaking of her as a Gentile and coming with Naomi and uh, as a proselyte. And uh, and so the Targum expands on that, and, and Boaz says, May the Lord reward you well in this world for your good work, and may you receive full recompense from the Lord, the God of Israel, in the world to come, because you have come to be a proselyte and to seek shelter under the shadow of his glorious presence. 
Through that merit, you will be saved from the punishment of Gehenom, so that your portion will be with Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. And so instead of a simple kind of uh, uh, blessing that is kind of generic, it really frames it apocalyptically, that you as a Gentile have come to declare that Naomi's God will be your God, and Naomi's people will be your people, and you've chosen to to throw your lot in on the right side of history, and you will escape the punishment of Gehenom, and you will be with the people of Israel, citing the, the you know the the great women of the patriarchs. Yeah, it's good. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it has an odd ending to the book in the Targums. Uh, um, in uh, in uh, chapter 4, verse 22, the Hebrew text just has Obed, Father Jesse, and Jesse, Father David. This is in chapter 4, verse 22. And the Targum expands on this with kind of a, a the, the scenario. If you think about it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have an apocalyptic reference to eschatology, but it frames death in a way that you can understand how they're processing the uh, the conclusion of death and where it's headed. But then the Targum says, Now Obed begot Jesse, who was called Nahash, because no corruption and perversion for which he might be delivered into the hands of the angel of death, who would take his life from him, were found in him. He lived a long time until the serpents counseled to Eve, Adam's wife, to partake of the fruit of the tree, the eating of which resulted in wisdom to distinguish between good and evil, was recalled before God. Because of that counsel, all inhabitants of the earth are mortal, and as a result of that blunder, the righteous Jesse died. He is Jesse, who is the father of David, the king of Israel. So basically, it's just a, it's kind of a random commentary about how Jesse was righteous, but Jesse had to die because everybody has to die. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, but I think it does play into kind of the apocalyptic tradition that is focused yeah. on mortality and how mortality came into existence True. because apocalypticism yeah. really f- emphasizes the, the eradication of mortality, how how you know, the resurrection of the dead, etc. And so even in this, it's kind of framing David as the second Adam. You know, Jesse is the yeah, first right. Adam and he died, but then David, he will be the second Adam. And of course, the son of David, the messi- the ultimate messianic one, he'll be the, the one that will finally eradicate what Adam brought in. So even yeah. with such a strange, odd ending, you, you can you can kind of make out why it's like that in the apocalyptic context. Right. That's really good. Really good. Well, guys, let's move on to Lamentations. Uh, And Lamentations, of course, is an interesting book, uh, interesting set of sayings throughout it. And uh, if we continue on our direction of the Targums, the Targum of Lamentations is dated somewhere around the 5th century AD by best estimates. But uh, yeah, what can we say about the Book of Lamentations? Um, as far as the the Targum of Lamentations, it's really a, it has a heavy pastoral orientation. And so instead of Daughter of Zion throughout the Targums, you get the Congregation of Zion, the exhortation. I think that happens seven times uh, throughout the book. And uh, for those unaware, the Lamentations has a very kind of structured poetic nature where it's five chapters of an acrostic poems. Each chapter, except chapter three, uh, which has 66, three times as many verses, but each chapter has 22 verses, one verse for each letter of the alphabet, and then each verse is a subsequent, starts with a subsequent letter of the alphabet. And it's a lamentation over the fall of Jerusalem, and therefore it's read generally in uh, throughout Jewish tradition on Tish B'Av, which is uh, the day that commemorates the destruction of both temples and the Holocaust and kind of the general tragedy of uh, Jewish history and tradition. And so uh, so the book has a fairly, uh, uh, it sounds a lot like the, the Psalms of Lament, 
Um, it begins kind of the same way that the book of Ruth ends with, uh, with a commentary on Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, Lamentations begins with Jeremiah the prophet and high priest said, so he, the Targumists clearly believe that, jo- that Jeremiah wrote it. Right. And it says, it, I won't read the whole thing, but basically it outlines that just like with Adam and Eve, them getting banished from the garden and God declaring, so God has declared over Jerusalem because of their sin and they've banished uh, uh uh, Israel from Jerusalem, from the garden. Uh, and it's framing it for a restoration because, of course, apocalyptic uh, ideology views a restoration at the end of an idyllic beginning. And so that's how the, the book kind of sets up in, in context to apocalyptic history that all of this tragedy that has happened in Israel's tradition really dates back to the garden. And it's a human tragedy that is playing out through the covenant centered uh, around this people. Yeah. Yeah. Again, here in Lamentations 2, verse 22, um, again, the hope is, is very clear and, and the, kind of the pastoral work of reaffirming the hope to the congregation, uh, really evident here. Uh, in the Targum, you will proclaim freedom to your people, the house of Israel, by the hand of the King Messiah, as you did by the hand of Moses and Aaron on the day of Passover. And my young men will be gathered around from every place, whether they were dispersed in the day of the fierceness of your anger, O Lord. And there was not among them survivor or remnant. So the same thing is it is essentially framing as the, you know, Lamentations is talking about the destruction of the temple. It's essentially at the same time uh, reiterating this prophecy of being regathered by the Messiah, the, the freedom that will come when the Messiah regathers all of the exiles that were sent away. Yeah, and you get a similar hope in Lamentations 4, in the Targumist in Lamentations 4.22. Uh, again, looking forward towards the Messiah. The Hebrew Bible says, The punishment of your, of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer, but your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. And then the Targumist, again, takes, like you said earlier, John, uh, moving from the daughter of Zion to the congregation of Zion. It says, after this, your iniquity will be expiated, congregation of Zion, and you shall be delivered at the hands of the King Messiah. And Elijah, the high priest, and the Lord shall no longer keep you in exile, right? So connecting the messianic hope, the hope of the prophets that had been held out and, you know, dating this Targum a little bit later, of course, this is the apocalyptic hope as well. And yeah, we see the similar theme throughout the book of Lamentations. Get a little get a little note of Elijah, the return of Elijah also at the end of the age yeah. there. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know a whole lot about that. All right. right. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, Ecclesiastes, guys. Another bizarre book that maybe you know, at least in, in the modern Christian tradition, often isn't read that much. Maybe a verse or two is, is pulled from it. Yeah. But in Hebrew, this is Kohelet in the Hebrew. And so what can we say about Kohelet? Um, Kohelet, uh, or the, the preacher uh, in Hebrew, um, <clears throat> is, uh, seems like, it, you know, reading both here in, uh, in the Targums as well as other... Um, other Jewish commentary on Kohelet, like there's a little bit in in the book of Enoch that's probably a bit of a response to Kohelet, because Kohelet kind of leaves an awkwardness. And it kind of leaves an awkwardness of like everything is pointless. So, and then, uh, you know, of course, he's going to, he's going to highlight the importance of, of, you know, fearing God and things like that. But, but the, the the rabbis were clearly uncomfortable with how how it kind of left you hanging, you know. It kind of was a little bit of a cliffhanger, and so when they elaborate, they just kind of want to finish off what King Solomon probably meant to say, but got cut short. Right. And so, again, filling in some of the tradition here. So Kohelet one verse two in in the Targum, when Solomon. The king of Israel saw through the Holy Spirit that the kingdom of Rehoboam, his son, would be divided with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 
and that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed, and the people of the household of Israel would go into exile, he said to himself, Vanity of vanities is this world. Vanity of vanities is is everything for which I and David my father labored. All of it is vanity. What does it profit a man after he dies from all his labors which he labors under the sun in this world unless he occupies himself with the Torah in order to receive a complete reward in the world to come before the master of the world? So very rabbinic idea of, of a reward. The uh, you know because in the Talmud there's a there's a discussion of who gets a greater reward and it's the Talmudic scholar or the uh, the Torah scholar that gets the greatest reward and so very much influence here but the point is is that in in the Targumus view vanity of vanities is Solomon contemplating all the work he put into the temple he and his dad all the work in preparation and in building and they said and he says vanity of vanities like we build it all And kind of the punchline is the world to come. So until things are rectified in the world to come, like building big, beautiful things is vanity. It's pointless because it's all just going to be consumed. And so that's that's kind of the way that they're going to frame the book of Kohelet. Right. Right. And that's how, you know, the book ends the last two verses in the Hebrew Bible. It says, verse 13 says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so the the Targumus kind of expands on this in a similar light and says, everything which is done in the world in secret will ultimately be published and announced to all people. Therefore, fear the word of the Lord and keep his commandments in order not to sin in secret. And if you do sin, be careful to repent, for thus is the proper way for all men to be for the Lord will bring every deed to the great day of judgment, which will make public everything which is hidden from men, whether good or evil. And so it it, uh, concludes kind of along the same lines of everything is vanity except for obeying what God has given us in light of the final judgment, which of course is what the prophetic tradition concludes with at the end of Malachi similarly. And it it actually almost seems like um, a section in in 1 Enoch, uh, the end of uh, paragraph 102 and the start of 103, um, is kind of referencing this idea, because this is kind of existential questions, right, of what's the, what is life worth and what is, what is work in this life worth if you don't carry it with you. And, and so, um, in, uh, the end of 102, uh, he says, when you die, the sinners will speak over you and they will say, as we die, so do the righteous die. What then have they gained by their deeds? Behold, like us, they died in grief and in darkness. And what have they more than we from now on, we have become equal. What will they receive or what or what will they see forever? So the idea is that after death, the righteous and the wicked become equal. And so it's vanity to pursue anything else. And so um, then the response of Enoch is, Now I swear to you, righteous ones, by the glory of the great one and the glory of his kingdom, I swear to you even by the great one, for all good things and joy and honor are prepared for and written down for the souls of those who died in righteousness. Many and good things will be given to you, the offshoot of your labors. Your lot extends even that of the living ones. The spirits of those who died in righteousness will live and rejoice. Their spirits will not perish, nor their memorial from before the face of the Great One and to all the generations of the world. Therefore, do not worry about their humiliation." So the, the, the point is, is it is kind of an existential question. Of, and this is like scholars would basically point this question of life beyond this age is actually, is actually becomes the, the prominent conversation during certain periods of Jewish history. And, and 
those conversations are later are later utilized a lot in apocalyptic literature because they become the logic for leaders to call the people to repentance and obedience and righteousness and humility is because life will not end in this age and they're wicked in this passage they're wrong they the, the righteous and the wicked won't always be equal after death that's not how the story is going to end and so that I think I think yeah. you have a lot of commentary on that in Jewish tradition because people can get the wrong idea from Kohelet that Kohelet just thought, yeah, nothing matters. Might as well just do whatever and 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 that's and that's not the case. And the Targumus and other tradition is trying to elaborate on that and clarify that that's not what he had in mind. Yeah, Bill, that's good. Well, guys, let's move on to our final book in the five scrolls, and that's the book of Esther. Esther is a weird one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> particularly the Targum, the Targum of Esther is, yeah. is odd and uh, has some particular, how do I say it? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that it's not bedtime reading, right? It's There's some rated R material in the Targum of Esther. I mean, not something you read particularly in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but yeah, in, in the Targum of Esther, for sure. Yeah, generally, the book of Esther is uh, read on Purim because it, uh, Purim, it celebrates the saving of the Jews from Haman. And, uh, and there are two Targums on uh, Esther, both of which have some fairly elaborate additions that are sometimes graphic. Uh, but yeah. the, the same ideas kind of go into it, uh, particularly messianic expectations and eschatological expectations. And it begins, like some of the others that we've looked at today, with an overview of history. So the Targum of verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days of Xerxes, which is the Hebrew uh, text, but then it, it expands on that. He is Xerxes, one of the ten kings who ruled and were destined to rule. Now these are the ten kings. The first kingdom that ruled is that of the Lord of hosts. May it be speedily revealed to us. The second kingdom is that of Nimrod. The third is that of the Pharaoh. The fourth kingdom is that of Israel. The fifth, that of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylonia. The sixth, that of Xerxes. The seventh, that of Rome. The eighth, that of Greece. The ninth, that of the son of David, the Messiah. The tenth, that of the Lord of hosts again, may it be speedily revealed to all the inhabitants of the earth. So it does kind of a, a vast sweep of history to put this particular story of Israel within its ultimate uh, eschatological and messianic context. Yeah, and uh, later tradition, later Jewish tradition, um, actually try, in, in the Midrash Rabbah, in, in Esther Rabbah, that it... Uh, it it really focuses on framing the the story of Esther and the scenario that's unfolding there in context of Deuteronomy twenty eight. Focuses on kind of reiterating that they're in that place because of a violation of the covenant, which is is basically it's it's important because when when you have this kind of view of history that is driven by the covenant, it's important that you're able to look back and see that it's a covenant dynamic happening. Because when you understand that they're there not randomly or because God couldn't sustain them in the land, and you go, oh, it's actually because it really was a covenant violation and the way that they were conducting themselves in terms of the covenant— then it actually starts to make sense of all of history. And so we've said this so many times, but it, that, that framework for history that, that sees the covenant as driving history is, is one of the uh, central w ways that, that the rabbinic readings read back on the uh, Purim story as well. Yeah, guys. Well, there's, of course, always much more that we could say about Chamesh Megillot, uh, the five scrolls, but... Uh, I think that hopefully, listeners, we've given you enough of a foundation to understand how Jews throughout history have read and understood these five different scrolls, seemingly unrelated, uh, but they interpret them all in terms of all of these themes that we've seen throughout the prophets, which is 
covenant, God's covenant with Israel, his covenant faithfulness, his chesed with them, the themes of exile and redemption and restoration, the themes of the Messiah, eschatological judgment. Uh, It shouldn't be a strange thing to us at this point, uh, if you've been tracking with us all season, um, to hear and understand uh, these seemingly unrelated books through that lens and how the Jews would have understood them. So in our show next week, we want to take some time and look at the book of Daniel. And we did mention this earlier on when we finished uh, Ezekiel in the Nevi'im that, you know, you might have been wondering, well, are you going to talk about Daniel now? Well, Daniel, as we have mentioned back then, is part of the Ketuvim. It's part of the writings. And so we want to take some time to work through some of the important themes. Of course, Daniel is massive in terms of apocalyptic expectation and and really laying the, the framework for first century Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. So much related to that in the book of Revelation. And uh, in in I mean Jesus of course uh, quotes and alludes to Daniel, so we want to spend some time working through Daniel next week. But until then, listeners, thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.